Ever wonder what Christianity was like under the apostles? Here's Tony Bosserman to give you a glimpse into original Christianity. Throughout history, kingdoms and nations have used images of beasts and birds to symbolize their power and identity. It's also true today. In the United States of America, our nation is symbolized by the bald eagle. Why? Because our founding fathers loved its regal appearance. They loved its fierce independence, kind of like the American spirit. And they loved its mothering instincts, kind of like we the people providing for the common defense and promoting the general welfare. To our north is the nation of Canada, and it is symbolized by a beaver. And many of you probably know that the Eurasian bear is the symbol of Russia and the panda bear the symbol of China. In the land down under, well, it's the kangaroo that is the symbol of the nation of Australia. And the Bengal tiger is the symbol of the nation of India. If the original Christians had seen a banner or a flag with an image of a she-wolf suckling two little boys, they would have known instantly and recognized that this was a symbol of the Roman Empire, the two boys being Romulus and Ramus, with Romulus being the namesake of the city of Rome. So it shouldn't be any surprise to us that the Bible would use images of various wild animals to symbolize nations and kingdoms, both historically and prophetically. So today, on today's edition of Original Christianity, we're going to take a look at some of these images that we find in the pages of your Bible. Turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 5 and verse 6, where we read this, A lion from the forest shall slay them, speaking of slaying Israel. A wolf of the desert shall destroy them, and a leopard will watch over their cities. Now, obviously, God is not talking about a single lion or a single wolf or leopard. What he's talking about is symbols of various nations and kingdoms at the time. And we read in Habakkuk chapter 1 that the Chaldean Empire was symbolized by a wolf. But we also see a couple of these animals in the book of Daniel chapter 7. So let's take a look at that. Daniel chapter 7 verse 3 says... And four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I watched till its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man, and a man's heart was given to it. So where do we see a winged lion in history? Well, we see it associated with the kings of Babylon. In fact, you can see that image in some of the ruins of ancient Babylon. And if you visit the Pergamon Museum in Germany, you can see a procession wall that's been restored, and it has images of a winged lion all over it. So God was using the winged lion to give Daniel a clue as to the nation, one of the nations that he had served, was Babylon. And then it talks about another beast. It says, and suddenly another beast, a second like a bear. And that Hebrew word, uh, akari, means successive. And so these are successive uh, kingdoms that come upon the earth. And it says, it was raised up on one side, this bear, and it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said thus to it, arise, devour much flesh. And so it did. And so historically, we can look at the fact that this kingdom, Persia, the Medo-Persian Empire, chewed up, you could say, three different kingdoms, the Babylonian kingdom, the Hittite kingdom of Asia Minor, and the Egyptian kingdom. And the Eurasian bear is very prominent in Persia and very prominent, of course, in today's Iran. And it's kind of uh, ironic that to that bear, symbolizing Iran, is now funneling weapons to another bear, the Eurasian bear of Russia, in its war against Ukraine. And so then it goes on to talk about a third beast. After this, I looked and there was another, like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. And the beast also had four heads and dominion was given to it. In Greek mythology, you can find uh, pictures of this. One of their gods, Dionysius, 
wore a leopard head as a skin over his head. And he was also pulled through the skies in a chariot by leopards. And so maybe God is showing us here that the leopard here was symbolic of the kingdom of Greece. And it leaves no doubt when it talks about these four heads on the back of the leopard there. And, you know, you find in history that after Alexander was defeated, his kingdom was divided among his four generals. So God, again, often uses these images of various beasts, wild beasts, to symbolize kingdoms both historically and prophetically. In Revelation 13, then, we see these three same images, the leopard, the bear, and, of course, the lion, repeated in an image that John the Apostle sees and he writes about. In Revelation 13, verse 1, it says, I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. The beast which I saw was like a leopard, its feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. So you can see that God has incorporated these three images into this now seven-headed beast that he describes. And we need to understand that the seven-headed beast gives us a broader look at history than did the images that Daniel received in his visions. And so if we go to Revelation 17, verses 9 and 10, it talks a little bit more about the symbolism of these seven heads. It says, here is the mind that has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains, and if you do a study of that word mountains, you're going to see that it's symbolic of kingdoms throughout the Bible. And so seven heads are seven kingdoms on which the woman, the harlot, sits. And there are also seven kings. Five have fallen, and the kingdoms that had fallen at the point that uh, the Apostle John received this vision were the Egyptian, the Assyrian, and then the Babylonian, pictured again by the lion, the Medo Persian, pictured by that bear, the leopard then, picturing the kingdom of Greece. And then it goes on to say that one is. So one of these heads was extant at the time, it was thriving. And that would have been the Roman Empire that the Apostle John was living under. And so the angel is conveying this to him. And then it says, and the other, the seventh head, has not yet come. And that was at the time that John received the vision. And history tells us that that was the Islamic Empire that swallowed up two-thirds of the Roman Empire. So, you know, these are poignant statements, very clear in the Bible, that five kingdoms had fallen at the time that John received this vision. One was, he was living under it, and one was yet to come. And so through this, we see these various images that point to specific kingdoms that have come and gone. And we know from this statement in the book of Revelation, chapter 13, verse 3, that I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marveled and followed the beast." So one of those seven heads is going to be healed. And the Bible, I think, really indicates to us which one it is. And we'll take a look at that in a little more detail in the second half of the show. But let's go back to a statement now that continues in Revelation 17, verses 11 and 12, where it says, The beast that was and is not. So that's speaking of the seven-headed beast. All seven of those kingdoms have come and gone. The beast that was and is not is himself also the eighth and is of the seven. That's a very important statement because it shows us that the eighth and final world ruling empire is going to be a resurrection of one of the previous seven. Therefore, it can't be Russia, it can't be the United States, it can't be the United Nations, it can't be any other entity that didn't exist before. And yet, you know, a lot of people talk about the United Nations as the beast or some other entity. And of course, Hal Lindsey made famous the late great planet Earth and, you know, some of the book series that he talked about, Russia being the beast. 
It's interesting that he's changed his tune on that since then. And so this statement then goes on to say that this eighth beast will eventually go to destruction. And it says the ten horns which you saw are ten kings who've received no kingdom as yet, but they receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast. These will make war with the lamb, and the lamb will overcome them. So this shows us that this is a kingdom that is extant at the time of Christ's return, and he is the one who defeats this final world-ruling empire. And it's made up of ten different kings that give their power to the beast. So eleven different entities, you could say. So it's very interesting that when you go back to the book of Daniel, remember there are four beasts described there. We only describe the first three that seem to exist in succession. And that is the leopard, the lion, and the bear. But then it goes on to say in Daniel chapter 7, verse 7, After this I, Daniel, saw the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth, and it was devouring and breaking in pieces and trampling the residue with its feet. So we also see a beast described here with ten horns, and it goes on to say later on in verse 26 of Daniel 7, But the heavenly court shall be seated and take away his dominion, speaking of this fourth beast, to consume and destroy it forever. So this shows that just like what we read in Revelation chapter 13 and 17 and the fact that Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, destroys that beast, well, the same thing is happening here. And so many theologians equate the fourth beast of Daniel 7 with the eighth beast, which is of the seven, in Revelation 13 and 17. And while they should, Because again, both have ten horns, and both are destroyed by the heavenly court sending Jesus Christ. So these are important things to understand if you want to understand the prophetic portrait outlined in the pages of your Bible. Because these images of various beasts are symbolic of actual historic kingdoms. We saw that the seven-headed beast symbolized Uh, kingdoms going way back to Egypt, the Egyptian, the Assyrian, the Babylonian, the Medo-Persian, the Greek, the Roman, and the Islamic empires, all of which have come and gone. And then again, remember, it says that one of those heads received a mortal wound, and that wound was healed. And so which head of the seven-headed beast is going to be healed? Well, we're going to take a look at that in detail in the second half and show you through seven signs that actually tell us the identity of that eighth beast. We'll do that right after this. No one would deny that a major part of the COVID-19 effect has been to bring an eerie silence over the earth throughout much of 2020. Empty streets, business offices, churches, schools, stadiums and parks, with billions of people sheltering in place, have dramatically lowered the decibel level generated by human beings throughout the world. Another part of the COVID-19 effect has been to greatly curb people's activity levels, resulting in an unparalleled, restful state in cities and countries everywhere. In retrospect, the year 2020 may be dubbed the year the Earth stood still. What most people are not aware of is that this COVID-19 effect was foretold in advance over 2,500 years ago, and it is the first of eight major events to come It was all revealed by the most accurate political forecaster in the history of mankind. Read Foretold and find out what's coming after the COVID-19 effect. To order your copy of Foretold the COVID-19 effect, visit OriginalChristianityReview.com or find us on Amazon. We've been talking about the fact that throughout history, nations and kingdoms have used images of beasts and birds to symbolize their identity and power. And we took a look at three such images from the Old Testament, a lion, symbolic of the Babylonian Empire, a bear, symbolic of the Medo-Persian Empire, and a leopard, symbolic of the Greek Empire. We also saw the fact that God incorporated these three images into an image of vision given to the Apostle John in the New Testament. 
And that vision went a little further, gave us a broader perspective on history. And so the seven heads were symbolic of the Egyptian Empire, the Assyrian Empire, the Babylonian, the Persian, the Greek, the Roman, and the Islamic empires. And we looked at the fact that the Bible says there's going to be an eighth beast, and it's going to be from the seven. So which one will it be? Does the Bible give us any clues? Well, yes, it does. It gives us seven signs that tell us the identity of that eighth and final beast, which will rule over the world. Let's begin in Revelation 20, verse 4, where it says, Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. So this shows that one of the signs of this eighth beast is that it's going to be beheading victims, beheading Christians. And of course, we all saw the images of ISIS lining up people in orange jumpsuits on the beach, causing them to kneel down and then beheading them. And so this has been a common practice throughout the history of Islam. Even Muhammad at the beginning practiced the beheading of his enemies. And so Revelation 13, 7 adds that the beast is going to persecute the saints. So that's the first sign. The second sign is that this system will traffic, it'll be involved in human trafficking of people. Revelation 18, verse 13 says, The merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her. Speaking of the harlot that rides the beast. Why? Because no one buys their merchandise anymore. So this is at the end, the demise of the beast and the harlot. And then it mentions some of the merchandise that it was famous for, wine and oil. And of course, we know that today, you know, about two-thirds of the oil throughout the world comes from the Middle East. But it also says they trafficked in bodies and souls of men. And so this is one of the most terrific practices in human history, isn't it? little boys and girls trafficked sexually to make money for kingdoms. And so again, we know that this has been happening in Saudi Arabia and other nations and happened historically again in the Islamic Empire. A third sign then is found in Revelation 13 verse 7 where it says authority was given him, the beast, over every tribe, tongue, and nation. Did you catch the significance of that? You know, there's never really been a world ruling empire in history. You know, the empire of Genghis Khan was the largest, and it basically covered Eurasia and parts of the Middle East, but not the whole world. This eighth and final beast is said to have authority over every tribe, tongue, and nation. And so its reach has to be around the world. And when you look at Islam today, you will find its tentacles reach all around the world into every major nation and city. And so it is well represented. And it could be an entity that could do this. And so imagine if this individual, we know he is, given the authority and the power to work miracles, well, that's going to stir people up. And even many non-Muslims are going to convert to Islam because they're going to believe that that represents the true God. And of course, it doesn't. And so they're going to stir people up in every nation and kingdom. Imagine millions of people in cities and nations around the world all wreaking havoc in nations. And so they're going to have to, of course, deal with that, every nation on earth. And it says eventually that, you know, they're going to fall under the authority of this ruling entity. In Daniel chapter 7, verse 25, it says that this eighth and final kingdom shall change times and laws. It's speaking specifically of the fourth beast in Daniel chapter 7. And so, when you look at uh, Islam, wherever it spreads, it changes times and laws. You know, now suddenly, all school systems have to give time off for Ramadan, and of course, many governments do as well, and they have to give some consideration to Sharia law. 
Did you know that over 300 court cases here in the United States of America have involved at least the consideration of some Sharia laws? And this is prominent throughout Europe as well. So wherever Islam expands, it brings with it changes in times and law. So that's a fourth identifying sign. Also, 1 John 2, verse 22 says, He is Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. And the Antichrist is another name for the beast and the king of the north and the little horn. And so this individual is going to teach and deny the Father and the Son. Did you know that on the Dome of the Rock it says, Allah has no son, and he's the only God. And so Islam teaches and believes that it is anathema to teach that God is a father figure. They think it, it demeans him somehow. And so we need to understand that fact, that here is the only religion on earth that specifically denies the fatherhood of God and the sonship of Jesus Christ. And then a sixth sign is found in the book of Revelation 13, verse 18, where it says, Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of man, and his number is 666. So it is the number of man. Well, what is the number of man? Well, man was created on the sixth day. And what religion gathers and worships on the sixth day? Well, that would be Islam on Fridays. And so that's one of the identifying signs of the beast. But we can take it further. If you study history, you will find that the rise of the Islamic Empire occurred and reached its initial height under the first caliphate around 666 A.D. And, of course, we don't have the exact date because they didn't keep a lot of uh, really good records. But it was during that time period, and there was no other kingdom on earth that rose to such prominence in the 7th century. And the seventh sign of the eighth beast is this, in Revelation 17, verse 3, And I saw a woman, a harlot, sitting on a scarlet beast. Now again, throughout this program, we've taken a look at the fact that nations and kingdoms are often symbolized by beasts but they're also symbolized by colors. And so our nation, the United States of America, is not only symbolized by a bald eagle, but by the colors red, white, and blue. China is not only symbolized by the panda bear, but by the color red. And it goes back clear to the Han Dynasty, which was the longest ruling dynasty in Chinese history. And so, if you do a little study and research, you'll find that there are eight flags used today by nations whose background is completely scarlet red. And those nations are Albania, and of course I mentioned China, Kyrgyzstan, Morocco, Switzerland, Tunisia, Turkey, and Vietnam. And we'll put a picture of their flags up there so you can see them. But you know that only one of those flags was a flag of one of those former seven heads, the seven-headed beast that received a mortal wound. And so that was Turkey. In fact, the Ottoman Empire's flag, and remember that it was centered in the nation of Turkey, it was headquartered there, was basically the same as the Turkey flag today. And that is, again, a scarlet red background with a white crescent moon and a white star. So this is significant, isn't it? And it points to the fact that Turkey is the prominent nation to watch in prophecy. And anybody that's watched me or heard me speak over the last 10 years has heard me say that and show that Turkey is the nation to watch. But there's even more that points to the nation of Turkey as being the head nation that will eventually pluck up three other nations and then have ten total nations give him his power. And so there is four cities that are spoken of prophetically that point to Turkey being, again, this eighth and final beast. We read the first one in Revelation 2, verse 13, 
that says to the angel of the church in Pergamon, which is modern-day Bergamon, Turkey, these are the words of him, Jesus, who has the sharp double-edged sword. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. Yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, not even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city, where Satan lives. Now again, it doesn't say that Satan's throne is in Moscow or Munich or any other city. It says specifically Pergamon, which is modern-day Bergamon, Turkey. And God says it twice for emphasis. That's where Satan's throne is. So that city points to Turkey being the eighth and final beast. In Acts 11, verse 26, it says, And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Well, Antioch was the headquarters of the king of the north, the Seleucid kingdom. And you can look at that. And that city is still extant today, and it is in southern Turkey. Then we have this statement in Ezekiel 27, verse 13. Tubal and Meshech were your, speaking of Tyre's, traders. And so the city of Tyre on the Lebanon coast, it traded with Tubal and Meshech in that day and age. They bartered human lives and vessels of bronze for merchandise. So again, notice there's human trafficking involved in the history here. And Josephus mentions that these city-states of Tubal and Meshech were extant cities in Asia Minor. And so they are not eponyms for, you know, Tobolsk and uh, Moscow today because they existed in that day and age. And here was the city of Tyre doing business with them. And then we read in Ezekiel 38, verse 3, I am against you, Gog, chief prince of Meshech and Tubal. So again, that's why many theologians believe that Gog is the beast, this eighth and final beast, because it is the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, two cities again that are located in Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey. So Hosea chapter 5, verse 7 says, They, Israel, have dealt treacherously with the Lord. So now a new moon shall devour them. In other words, this new moon, which is symbolic of Islam, is going to devour Israel. So the king of the north is coming against Israel. And again, we have seven signs that point to the nation of Turkey and the restoration of the Ottoman Empire. So we need to understand that God gives us these clues so that we can understand who will become the eighth and final world-ruling beast. And the original Christians understood at least some of these images, not the seventh and the eighth, but they understood the first six because they saw it in the pages of the Bible. So remember, if original Christianity was good enough for Jesus and the disciples, it should be good enough for you and me Thanks for watching.